Good afternoon and welcome to the, the Diversified Energy Company PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received during the meeting itself. How the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Rusty Hudson, CEO. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to spend some time uh, going through uh, parts of the cor uh, corporate presentation uh, that we uh, presented on Monday at our earnings call. Uh, we're not going to go through every slide, but we're going to try to go through the, the, the pertinent slides that I feel uh, you as potential investors would want to, to know about the company, about our strategy, uh, kind of where we sit in the in the space today uh, and kind of what our future plans are as we move forward. So with that, I'd like to turn to uh, slide four and, and start here. Um, wait for the slide. Slide four. Thank you. Um, so diversified, obviously, we are a, um, a publicly traded company here in, in uh, London. However, all of our operations are on shore U.S., specifically in the Appalachian Basin, uh, of the of the mid Atlantic part of the United States, and also in the central region of Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, a um, few things that are really pertinent to our business. Number one, our uh, long life low decl decline production. Uh, we have the lowest uh, decline rate uh, in the sector in the U.S. at eight and a half percent. We have a long long life low decline production, which means we're able to have a lot of visibility into our production uh, and what it's going to be over time. So we hedge. Of a significant amount of that uh, to lock in cash flows and assure that our business uh, can be uh, operated efficiently, pay down our, our leverage and our debt, and, and then also pay dividends to our shareholders. We currently about 90% hedged through the end of 22. And then we have one of the, not only one of the largest, but one of the most uh, consistent free cash flow yields uh, in the industry at around 22% this year, which has been that way for multiple years in a row. We like to buy. We're an acquirer of assets. We're an acquirer of production. We're not a driller or completing completing wells, um, but we're opt we're buying wells, optimizing and enhancing production, uh, driving operational efficiencies through the business, driving cash margins, uh, and then cash flows that we then can service uh, and pay dividends to our shareholders. Um, you can see some of the differentiated um, th uh, descriptions about the business that makes us different than everybody else. You know, we look to vertically integrate the business, reduce expenses throughout our operation uh, and expand margins over time as we grow areas like our central region, which we just entered last year. Um, we're, we're shareholder return focused, and we'll talk about that in a minute on our strategic objectives. Um, and then, you know, in we've always been a steward and an ESG motivated company. Uh, but what has really happened in the last 12 to 15 months is just we've accelerated the emission reduction aspect of that, and we'll, we'll go through that in a minute. Uh, you can see some of the, the trading uh, metrics of the company. We went public in 2017, uh, $50 million IPO as we sit here today, $1.4 billion market cap, um, uh, enterprise value of uh, 2.6. Uh, and as we sit here today, pre Conoco deal, which is one we just announced in the last two weeks, uh, with over 400 million of liquidity for additional acquisitions. We produce it about 138,000, 139,000 BOE per day, but with Conoco, it'll be about 147. Um, we're 90 some percent natural gas, which I think is important uh, in the in the environment we're in today. Um, we talked about our decline rates uh, and we own midstream assets, which makes it a very um, a vertically integrated business and, and being able to uh, cut the cost of what it takes to move our gas to market. If you'll flip the uh, slide five, please. Strate the strategic objectives, and these are really things that we set uh, with our institutional investors uh, when we went public. Uh, we talked to them about the fact that we're going to prioritize shareholder returns, and we're going to really do that through a sustainable dividend policy, uh, which now we have uh, executed on for the last five and a half years. Um, and we're going to take free cash flow. We're going to reduce our debt uh, and we're going to grow our business in a non-dilutive way. And we've been very successful in doing that over the, the course of our public life. Um, we're going to drive value through a, an accretive acquisition approach versus a drill bit. Uh, we look at the on, on a risk adjusted basis. 
we look at acquisitions, the, the internal rate of return on those to be much more sustainable and higher than the drill bit for us. Uh, and so, and, and much less capital intensive for sure. Um, and we're able to not only do acquire these assets, but then drive additional efficiencies and synergies in the business that uh, creates uh, more sustainable and, and larger cash margins um, that we can then pay dividends to our shareholders. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we're committed to the ESG narrative, uh, specifically being very aggressive as it relates to reducing emissions. Uh, we've, we've done a, a significant amount of projects related to uh, emissions reduction, uh, related to uh, emission detection equipment that we're utilizing on our wells to, to identify uh, and correct uh, methane emissions. Uh, we're flying over our midstream businesses or operations with uh, flyover LIDAR, which is identifying uh, any kind of emissions related to the pipeline and the midstream business. Uh, and then we're also um, in the process of um, transferring all of our uh, methane actuated pneumatic devices to other methods that uh, reduce and, and zero out those emissions on those uh, devices. And then the last thing that we told our uh, you know, we've uh, committed to our shareholders is that we're going to uh, keep the balance sheet strong. We'll never um, risk the balance sheet uh, just for the sake of growth. And so we're going to we have a, a leverage profile that we're very comfortable with in terms of uh, uh, maximizing shareholder returns. And we've stayed there very consistently over the last five and a half years, as we told um, the industry or, or the institutional investors we would. And that's um, supported with our decline profile being so low uh, and our ability to hedge and, 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 and create predictable cash flows. Uh, flipping to page, all the way over to page eight, please. So all of these things really um, drive what we see here on this, on this uh, slide, and that's in this right-hand corner, is our our production profile, low declines, our ability to hedge production in any type of market, um, our ability to execute on the transactions and the acquisitions that we've had uh, over the last five and a half years, and also the ability to pay dividends and progress that di dividend over those five and a half years as we've grown the business. You can see here, over, since our IPO, uh, we have a total shareholder return of 250%. And that compares to the rest of the MP sector uh, over that same time period of 17%. And most of their total shareholder return has been really, uh, uh, you know, in the last year and a half. Uh, as prices have went up, uh, they've been able to execute on a decent strategy. But up until that point in a very low price environment, when uh, and then drilling through cash flows like they were over that period of time, uh, they weren't able to keep up. Our, our business strategy has been very consistent uh, and really doing what we said we would do and it's, and it's paid off in, in uh, long-term uh, shareholder returns for our shareholders. Uh, and on page nine, real quick, you can see down here at the bottom, this, this is uh, just another uh, view of, this, uh, of that return, but you can see the progression of the dividend over the last five and a half years in terms of per share. And that has went up even in lower price environments. When prices have went down, Henry Hub prices at 208, we actually increased our dividend. Through the pandemic, we increased our dividend. Uh, and the only way that you can do that and manage that is through uh, the, the kind of business and the model that we deploy um, in long life, low decline assets and hedging and, and, and making sure that we're locking in those cash flows. And you can see we've paid over 492 million of dividends uh, since our 2017 IPO. We continue to see a peer leading uh, dividend yield at 11%. We protect our margins with the, the production that we hedge. Um, our, over the last uh, five years, our margin has remained in that 48 to 52% range through, the, through all the different price environments. And we, have, we continue to generate a very strong free cash flow yield at 22%. On page 10 and 11, I won't stay here very long, uh, but I'll just want to walk through kind of as we looked at the business and we started coming into this earnings season. Uh, one of the things we saw was let's look at how we are disconnected in terms of the share price and the valuation of the company to some of our other industries and, and some of the other peers in our in the EMP sector. You can see here on page uh, 10, 
uh, our free cash flow to enterprise value, so not to market cap, but to enterprise value, is almost 13%. And if you look at all these other industries and what their free cash flow uh, yields are in the same metric, they're about one third of what our free cash flow yield is. But when you look to the left and you look at the multiples that all these companies in these industries are trading at, we're one third of pretty much of what they're trading at. And, and so it's disconnected. We're, we're earning a lot more cash and free cash flowing a lot more, but we're trading at a much less multiple than the other uh, sectors are. And if you turn to page 11, get a, another look at this from a, even from our own sector, we have the top dividend yield uh, in the MP sector there on the left. We also have the number two uh, free cash flow yield as it relates to market cap in the sector. But if you look at the three year historic average over that same period of time or over those two same metrics, we had a 10.2 percent dividend yield over the last three years on average versus the rest of the sector of less than three. And, and again, most of that's been generated in the last 12 months. And the same for the free cash flow yield. Three three year historic average for us has been a 23 and a half. And that really has been 20 plus for the last five years. And then if you look at the rest of the sector, it's 10.2. And that, again, has all been really um, generated in the last 12 months. And, and the other sectors don't even come close to any of these numbers. In fact, if you look at the MP sector in general um, and, and compare it to the total of the, the weighting of the S&P 500, we're about one, one and a half percent. The sector is one and a half percent of the S&P 500, but generating almost 40 percent of the free cash flow of the S&P 500. So there's a, a tremendous um, undervalue, undervaluation of, of the EMP sector and specifically diversified. Turn to page 12 and then, um, yeah, and this right here is, is clearly shows what, what I'm talking about. If you look at diversified, the blue line at the bottom, it's tracked pretty up until last year when the prices started to go up significantly, we tracked right along with the commodity. But since the price has increased, you can see that we have kind of stayed consistently, you know, flat uh, over the last several months. But the but the market, the commodity price has went up tremendously. And this is a 10 year uh, NYMEX strip uh, from from the year end 21. So you can see that huge share price uh, dislocation uh, as it relates to the commodity at this point. And, and then the final uh, comparison is on the right. If you take our current share price, uh, which this was as of beginning of the week or so, but dollar forty-eight cents per share, and you compare that to the value of the assets that we have today on a future cash flow basis, present valued back to today at ten percent, which is the the way that the industry typically will value these assets. And you you take that value, what we call PDP value, you subtract out the debt and you subtract out the mark to market on our hedge portfolio. We should be at a at, that rep represents a two dollars and eighty two cents per share. Again, a fifty percent discount to our current price. So there's definitely market valuation um, dislocation here that we wanted to highlight. And if you look at page thirteen real quick, as it relates to the and, and again, this goes all into the valuation because the natural gas macro in the U.S. continues to be extremely strong. Uh, production has remained relatively flat and really muted by the, the inability to get new uh, infrastructure built that will help to move the, the, the product to market that in, in, has really kept companies from drilling more wells because of that um, continues to be, the weather has been very supportive from an electric, electricity generation demand, um, tighten global balances, obviously with the Russian situation that we have today and the pipelines that are going into uh, Eastern Europe, there's, difficult problems and, and a lot of issues from a macro perspective related to that and tighten global uh, balances. We have extremely low storage levels in the U.S. right now, which again is playing into gas prices. Um, we are a large LNG exporter and we'll only get larger from here as we double the capacity of LNG exports going into 2026. There's going to be almost one fourth of the natural gas production in the U.S. that will be exported on an annual basis to other countries. That's going to a continue to put um, tightness into the, the U.S. domestic market as you're, you know, you're ex, uh, exporting almost 25 percent of the existing production. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, producers have remained very resilient in, not, in capital discipline and making sure that they're not 
going against their shareholder wishes, which is don't spend, you know, drill through your cash flow. We need we need a return. And so all of these things have resulted, as you can see to the left, in a very tight natural gas macro in the U.S., which will play well for long term gas prices. With that, I'm going to quickly pass it over to Eric to just do some brief overviews of some of the financial highlights from the first half. And then I'll come back on at the end to talk about where, where I see the rest of the year as it relates to um, diversify. Thanks, Rusty. <clears throat> and for everyone's benefit, I'll, I'll do a quick um, spin through the, the operations update that Brad gave just to set the table for the financial update and give context. Uh, I would encourage you know, many of you know, we did our full earnings call on Monday. We have that audio presentation on the website as well as the slide deck that we're going through. Those comments are, are more fulsome and, and may give a, a better, um, full, well-rounded view of, of some of the materials we're covering here. Uh, but we wanted to be sure there was good time for Q&A so that we could really address the things that are directly on your mind. So keeping all of that uh, in focus. Uh, turning to page 17, uh, one of the things that Brad did a great job of highlighting is giving context to the significance and importance of our asset retirement strategy and the tremendous progress we've made here to, to continue to demonstrate to the market just how it is that we'll ultimately meet those obligations. Started in 2018 with our commitment to work with the states on long-term agreements. That was affirmation, not only of, of the work that we had to do, but also of the long life nature of the, the portfolio that we've accumulated. Uh, we worked with the states to put in place uh, 10 to as long as 20 year agreements uh, that really outline the amount of work that we have to do and then beginning in 2021 and fast forwarding into 22, you can see that significant growth in our internal plugging capacities. Uh, by our estimates, we, we uh, now have about 20% of all the plugging capacity in the basin, moving from one crew all the way up to, or one rig all the way up to 15 rigs. Uh, that gives us the ability to plug about 600 wells per year. And then simultaneously using that capacity to begin to plug more and more of our own wells. And uh, you know we have a track record of doing a great job of plugging those very inexpensively at $25,000 per well back in 2020. Today, as of the half year, our average was $21,000. So uh, a 16% reduction, and that's on a blended using external plus internal capacities. If you look just at our internal plugging jobs, they're about 30% lower versus continued market rates. So there's a, a nice downward bias to that. But that's that's something that we made a big commitment to, to expand within our business, and we certainly have successfully done so. Uh, 18 is just a quick snapshot. We are an acquisition model, but importantly, our strategy is to acquire similar asset mm -hmm. types. So we call that asset profile. And whether it's Indigo all the way across the page to the ConocoPhillips deal, uh, that asset is very similar. Long life, low decline. We match that with a very consistent cost structure, thanks to our vertical integration that now includes that PA we just talked about. Uh, and then we'll talk about hedging in just a little bit. But Brad's team as part of our operations strategy is to, is to standardize our operations across that larger footprint. And so we integrate, we optimize, we consolidate, and ultimately we operate as one company, harvesting the best of all the ideas uh, because an, a key tenant of our growth has been to retain the operational talent that understands these assets better than anybody. And so under our uh, ownership, they lead us to the opportunities that we then empower uh, the men and women in the field uh, to bring forward value. If you flip to, to 19 and, and we'll just quickly flip this is our ex specific examples of those ideas that the field brings us that we then turn into dollars and cents that are the, the, the cornerstone of the dividends and debt repayments that we make. Uh, 20 is just a quick, I'd call this a case study of one of the acquisitions that we've done. You can see we paid an incredible, uh, just 1.6 times the, the tr next 12 months cash flow. So less than two years of cash flow to buy that asset. But we quickly went to work on that asset. You can see some of the examples of, of ways that that operations team uh, continued to add more value. And if you took the economic benefit from those, those uh, projects, the now multiple that we've paid is about 1.4 times. And so that, that gives you a sense as to just how differentiated an operations centric model is versus one that's uh, focused on development. Ultimately on page 21, you can see how that rolls through and to our asset base. 
Uh, you see a tremendous increase in production, uh, going from 109 barrels of oil equivalency per day a year ago, or two years ago, to just under 150 barrels of oil equivalency per day, uh, inclusive of our most recent ConocoPhillips deal that we've announced. Uh, and similarly, you see a tremendous step change in the value of those proved reserves, i.e., the product, the, the reserves that are in the ground that are the, the cornerstone of our future cash flows growing from uh, just under $2 billion in 2020 uh, to as of year end and adjusted for what we've acquired this year, uh, over $4 billion. And if you fast forward and looked at current prices, uh, that number could be north of $5 billion. So tremendous um, reserve growth and, and that is the, uh, the future cash flows of the business. Uh, ending in Brad's section on page 22 is, is just a reminder and this goes to the to really tie together what Rusty was speaking to with respect to the way that we think about valuation and, and why we're differentiated in the market and, and how, where we should trade within that universe uh, is that our asset profile is unlike anybody else's because we're not trying to outrun the declines of new wells that come off very quickly. Uh, we've built an entire portfolio now on very low decline assets because we buy them in their more mature status. You can see our corporate decline, meaning the amount our production would fall based on engineered estimates each year is eight and a half percent. Our nearest peer is three times that at 21 percent. And you can see the peer average uh, is is nearly four times higher at 27 uh, percent. So we sit in a very nice place that gives us a, 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 a very comfortable ability to, to reinvest into the business to sustain our cash flows which makes our dividend that much more durable. I'll move now into to the section that, uh, that I talked about on the call, which is our financial update on page 24. Uh, here, you know, we, we talk more about margins than we do about price and expenses uh, because pricing differs by region, expenses can differ by region. And what we like to do is, is, uh, is deliver a consistent margin to the investors that it, again underpins those debt repayments and dividend distributions that we make on a regular basis. Uh, and you've seen Rusty highlighted that that growth in our dividend over time. And it's because we've gotten more and more efficient with the assets, uh, built strong margins and now have a multi year track record of maintaining those. And here you can see that while costs are notionally higher, that's really a product of the production mix. Uh, back in, in the first half of 2021, we were an entirely Appalachia based company. So while we had a nice operating uh, cost of including GNA of, of $7.84 per BOE, we were realizing a little under $16 uh, per BOE in revenue. But as we added the central region and some of the macro themes that are going on in natural gas that Rusty talked about, access to the Gulf Coast where we get premium pricing. And candidly, as the U.S. is becoming a larger and larger exporter of natural gas through liquidification, much of that gas coming over here to, to the UK and Europe, you're seeing that there's tremendous pricing opportunity on that production. So without the benefit of what's emerging, just where we are today, you see a nearly $3 improvement in our realized price uh, moving up to $18.88 against a, about a $2 increase in our cost, all in a very healthy margin. But as I mentioned on the call, what I'm really excited about is that when you look at that unhedged margin, moving from 53%, which was great, to today, 76%, because natural gas prices are so much higher and the outlook for natural gas is so much stronger. It's that number that I'm beginning to be able to hedge and capture in my portfolio so that over time, I, my realized price can continue to go up both across Appalachia and in the central region to allow us to push that margin well above 50% uh, once again. So that's certainly one of our focuses. 25, moving to page 25, we wanted to stress that even as we head into a much better commodity price environment, our commitment to hedging doesn't change. Um, the way we approach hedging will, will certainly adapt to the market, but we believe fundamentally that long life, low to kind production matched with a stable cost structure should be matched with stable cash flows and you achieve that through hedging. Um, and so we've, we've always said that over the next uh, 12 months, we want to be anywhere from 70 to 90 percent hedge with that number falling as you go further out. But uh, but giving a clear visibility into the durability of our cash flows that, that ultimately paid the dividend. Um, what we what we're reminding is that if you went back to 2017 and 2018, 
when prices undulated between $2.50 and $3.50, you could get a nice collar that made sense. Uh, they gave you a good floor price of, say, $2.25 and a ceiling of, say, $3.50, $3.75. Um, and so you would see us use those so that we had exposure to upside in the commodity. But as the commodity became very tight in 2019 and certainly 2020, 20, and then early 21, you saw prices moving between $2 and $2.50, $2.60. So a collar would have afforded you a floor of about $1.80 and a ceiling of, say, $2.50, $2.60. And that $1.80 was just a number that we were not comfortable um, exposing the business to in order to really maintain that healthy dividend. So we used swaps and picked a number that we knew provided a strong margin. I tell that because as you move forward and we're seeing so much more volatility in commodities, that's gonna to work to our benefit uh, without introducing risk to the business. Mm -hmm. Because what we can do is begin to use collars again that say are $4 floor, $7 ceilings, and give us this, you know, meaningful exposure as gas prices rise while continuing to provide a very, very healthy foundation for uh, our uh, margins. And if you think about the fact that our realized natural gas price in the last period was around $3, and we're now looking at the ability to put a $4 floor in, therein lies why we talk about having the confidence and the, the upward uh, momentum for margins on a go forward. Page 26, you know, we've talked a lot about financing the business and a key goal of ours was to transition away from using equity uh, in large quantums to grow and lean more on the cash flows that the business generates uh, and our ability to access, access low cost, low risk financing. And we've been able to do both. As we talked about um, earlier, we've grown EBITDA alongside that production dramatically. And if you took our first half year EBITDA and doubled it, if you just annualized it without the benefit of, of Conoco, that's about a $450 million number. And so compare that to our EBITDA at IPO of around $10 million, and you can see just how much we've grown. Well, that, that cash flow gives us the ability to meet our uh, obligations of debt repayments, our dividends, but also reinvest into the business uh, while maintaining, maintaining a healthy leverage ratio. And I say that to say that, that now you can see throughout all of these years, from 2017 to 2022, we've grown using debt and equity and kept our leverage in that yellow row between 1.8 and 2.2 times, which was, was well within our stated commitments of two to two and a half times. Um, and we've not needed as much equity for even large deals like the ConocoPhillips deal that we just announced at 240 million, 210 million net, uh, we'll do using the balance sheet. Uh, but as Rusty said, we'll never risk the balance sheet. And so we keep a close eye on that, that dotted box that you see on the top of each stack. And that is our liquidity. And that's the, the amount of, of uh, firepower, if you will, that we have to, to continue to be very offensive as we acquire our assets. And the blue stack that sits below that is our securitized debt. That's that investment grade rated, low coupon, well-hedged uh, debt that affords us a blended rate of, of just 5% uh, while keeping the balance sheet very safe. Uh, so that, that's been a, a real success as we've continued to, to finance the business. I'll pass over 27. That's just a continuation of the same narrative around the asset backed securitization and spend a minute on the financial consequence of, of our uh, investment in, in asset retirement on page 28. And if you'll recall, uh, we highlighted the fact that, that as Brad's grown our plugging capacity through the acquisition of multiple uh, asset retirement companies, you are seeing that well retirement cost come down from 25,000 a well to 21,000 a well. But not only that, but it, it also affords us um, a significant, significant amount of opportunity to generate uh, third party revenues as we plug wells for others um, and as well as continue to grow our knowledge base in uh, how to better and better retire wells that will give us the ability to continue to drive those costs lower. And we continue to carry in the appendix to the presentation, this the slide that many of you may have seen at your end where we, we show that if you took that 30% savings uh, that we've eliminated by taking the third party uh, margin out and doing it for ourselves, that can have a significant um, positive read through by lowering our asset retirement obligation. Um, and just by 30% by reduction, you're looking at about a $500 million advantage to the business. So still very, very significant. 
wrap up on slide 29 just by making the point that again we've built this business to deliver strong cash flows strong margins and the ability to to, to sustain a healthy dividend I think we're one of the few that certainly during the pandemic uh, were privileged to be able to raise that dividend. You can see in 2020, uh, we stepped it up to 15 and a quarter cents annualized and the yield went from 11 to 13. Coming into 2021, uh, we continued to raise that at, to 16 and a half cents and maintained that double digit yield. And even today, uh, including all that growth that we've developed over the last five years, now it's 17 cents annualized and a yield that's still 11%. The, the dividend is, is a, a reasonable payout when you look at that in co co correlation to the amount of cash flow, that $448 million that we generate. Um, but what's, what, what we expect to see is our ability to compress that yield by continuing to demonstrate the durability uh, of our business model as we move forward. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Rusty for some final comments, and then we'll do Q&A. Thank you, Eric. Um, just so as I look at 2022, just go through a quick um, overview of kind of how I see the rest of the year playing out. Obviously, we're going to stay really, really focused on uh, optimizing our operational uh, capabilities. We have a lot of assets. We have a lot of new assets in the portfolio. We're going to look at ways to enhance uh, production on those wells and to take advantage of an organic growth in the production profile, but also uh, looking to lean on efficiencies and making sure that we're operating in the most efficient manner. Uh, we'll continue to, to drive down our re, uh, emissions. Um, you know, stated earlier, some of the projects that we have going on, that's going to be a continual project and, and we will stay really, really aggressive on managing that down. Um, we're going to look at ways to uh, capture higher prices in the portfolio, whether that be through, you know, hedges rolling off and, and uh, entering into new contracts at a much higher price than obviously the, the, the previous ones, uh, but looking at ways to improve our pricing on a going forward basis. Uh, continue to look at ways to enhance liquidity. You know, obviously we have a lot of liquidity as we see here today. Uh, on the back end of the Conico deal, we'll still have over 400 million of liquidity that we can then drive and, and look for other acquisitions and be able to execute on those. Um, and then um, look at continue to look at ways to vertically integrate the business, whether that be upstream, midstream, plugging opportunities. We've grown the plugging business, as Eric said earlier, to a, to a large scale business now that will continue to pay dividends for us and driving down our plugging costs and being able to uh, show a much smaller liability as it relates to the ARO. But at the end of the day, we we'll continue to look at ways to these value chain integrations uh, drive down our overall metrics as it relates to expenses and cost. So with that, I'll turn it back to the moderator um, and we'll, we'll open up for Q and A. That's great. Rusty, Eric, thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Just so while Rusty and Eric take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Um, Eric, Rusty, as you know, we had a number of pre-submitted questions and we've received a number of uh, questions throughout uh, today's presentation. So thank you to everybody that's taken the time to uh, let us have your, your question. So perhaps if I may start with the following, which reads as follows. Are you expecting the recent acquisition with its 20% hedge adjusted EBITDA increase to lead to an increased dividend? Well, I'll, I'll answer that real quick. We obviously have, have been very uh, clear as we grow the business, uh, as we uh, grow cash flows, that the, the one way that we re, uh, focus on returning uh, to, you know, to our shareholders and, and returns for our shareholders is through the cash dividend. And so as the business grows, uh, as the cash flows grow, uh, we obviously will always look at ways to uh, increase the dividend in a way that's meaningful, but at the same time, protecting our ability uh, to grow the business organically so that there's less reliance uh, over the long haul on the equity uh, to do that. So the, the answer is, we all, we're always, um, as we grow the business, we'll, we'll raise the dividend, and, um, and but we'll do it in a way that's, um, you know, methodical and make sure that we're protecting our ability to do business going forward and grow the business. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's turn, if I may, to the next uh, question. This one was pre-submitted and it reads as follows. Can Oak Hill still participate in the recent acquisition? And further to that, is this likely? 
yeah, the, well, the Conoco deal, they are not participating in. So it's a hundred percent us. Um, they obviously still have a $500 million commitment that, that, uh, you know, in our con in our contractual obligation with each other, but th they don't have to, uh, they're not required to participate in anything. They can look at it, decide whether they want to or not. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's their decision. Uh, and we're indifferent. I mean, we'd love for them to come alongside us in a lot of the deals, but if they don't, most of the deals that we're that we're looking at, and if we want to do it, it just means it's a little bit bigger for us. But we'll we'll be more than happy uh, to close on those deals. So uh, yes, they still have 500 million of uh, uh, capabilities, um, but they are not going to participate in the Conoco deal. That's 100 percent us. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've received a, a number of questions from John from Keys. Uh, thank you to you both for, for your questions. And we had a pre-submitted question as well relating um, to your US listing and, and really asking when will you have a US listing and perhaps if you could expand around uh, that, that'd be great. Yeah. So what, what we talked about on the year end call was that the nice thing about having the 2021 audit completed was we had all the historical financial information that we needed to begin that process with the SEC in the United States. Uh, so you can expect we did. Uh, we've been hard at work on that over that period of time. We continue to have good dialogue with U.S. investors uh, while simultaneously produce, progressing those documents. And, and just to, to give a general framework, if, if, you, if that process were to go as it typically does, uh, and we certainly can't predict timing and, and the conversations back and forth with the uh, through the comment lift process on those documents, uh, we could be in a position by the uh, certainly late third quarter, uh, which which gives us, I think, a nice runway to, to look at the right catalyst opportunity uh, sometime this year. Uh, so, yeah, it is it, it continues to be certainly a, a big project for my team uh, working closely with our legal team. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Eric. Um, next question I know you did touch on, but if there's any other clarity you can give, is your gas used only in the U.S. market or is some of it exported? Well, we don't have any direct contracts with the LNG uh, export facilities, but but I will say it is used in the U.S., but because we have uh, Gulf Coast natural gas exposure, uh, we definitely are benefiting from the pricing of that of that gas. So even though we don't have a direct feed into the LNG facilities indirectly, we, we still get uh, a gas price in the Gulf Coast that equates to what those LNG, uh, the, the companies that are producing into the LNG facilities get. So we, we do produce everything in the U.S. Everything we, we produ uh, produce is used in the U.S., but we do benefit from the, the LNG uh, export uh, facilities and, and the prices that they get. Yeah, I think what, to give an analogy, you've seen the globalization of oil through, you know, with WTI and Brent really beginning to compress. And I think as more and more gas has the opportunity to to migrate away from the U.S. through these international markets, you'll see that the, the international price for natural gas begin to converge with the U.S. price, um, with the difference being the, the cost of transport and, and liquefaction. So I think it, it it bodes really well for for all natural gas producers in the U.S. That's great, thanks, Eric. Um, touching on to the next question, if I may, please can you quantify and put into perspective the methane emissions from diversified wells and outline the strategy for reducing those emissions? Yep. Well, if you go, you know, annually, we were for the last three years, we've. Uh, submitted a um, sustainability report, which I think is is first class and, and one of the best in the industry as it relates to the, the disclosures and what we're providing to our uh, investors and potential investors. Uh, and so we, we, we obviously uh, disclose multiple things, but mostly it's pure emissions and that, you know, uh, measured in metric tons and then met, uh, methane emissions intensity levels or CO2, or what is it called? GHG intensity levels. Uh, we, we, we submit both of those on an annual basis. And that has come down significantly over the last uh, three years uh, and continues to, and will, and will in 22. We talked about it, you know, what we're doing, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, you know, we've become very uh, aggressive on this. And so we, we've deployed handheld methane uh, emissions detection devices into the field with our employees so that they can on a, can go to every well and measure on a well by well basis and identify leaks and methane emissions that they can then correct because at the end of the day it's good business for us we want to correct all those leaks we want that 
methane to go to a sales meter, not into the atmosphere. So that's one way that we're doing it. And we'll be, you know, we're on a uh, course to, to visit every well by the end of September uh, for the first time. And that just started in, in January. The other thing that we're doing is we're, we're doing flyover LIDARs on all of our midstream assets and identifying any kind of pipeline leaks that necess that may need to be corrected. And so that's been ongoing. We've done about 6,000 miles of pipeline reviews already. And uh, we're, we're uh, you know, be, we think we'll be able to complete that by the end of the year on the whole midstream asset. Uh, and then the third thing, which is the only other thing really that relates to methane for methane emissions for any oil and gas company uh, is pneumatic devices. And those pneumatic devices are actuated off of natural gas in this case. And so we've been in a process of replacing those with other uh, ways and means of actuating them. For example, air compression or uh, generated power from solar. Uh, and so we're looking at those and we're in the process of replacing those pneumatic devices or removing them completely from the field so that those are not emitting. So those are the three things that we're doing. Uh, and then really indirectly, not really related to emissions directly, uh, is our asset retirement uh, program in which we are uh, really, we're, we're retiring more wells on an annual basis than pretty much every other operator in the basin, so in, in Appalachia. So uh, those are the kind of things that we're working on that uh, will have tremendous impacts on that, not only the overall emissions, but the emissions intensity going forward. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, turning to a question from Michael J. Thank you, Michael, uh, who asks, how aggressively are you looking to grow your well plugging business? I presume there are plenty of mum and pup businesses out there uh, that you could acquire and bolt on. And that kind of touches nicely onto a number of questions from Joshua and Alex talking about acquisitions and your views on that. Yeah, well, on the plugging side, we've now acquired three different plugging companies. We're up to about 15 plugging crews. We feel like that's a pretty good number for us at this present time. I don't know if we'll add anything, at least in the near term. Now we may get into it and, and start to, you know, see benefits that we, you know, the, to having more plugging crews out there. What, what's really nice about it, and Eric uh, was speaking about it earlier, is now we're able to not only do our own wells, but we're able to work for third parties. Uh, and so, for example, we've won two contracts with the state of West Virginia already to plug their abandoned wells, their orphan wells that the, mon that the federal monies are are going to cover. Each of the states are getting federal money to uh, plug orphan wells that they own. And so we're bidding on that work. We've won work for West Virginia. We've won work for Ohio. So we've got a significant amount of work out there. So I think with the 15 we have, we feel pretty comfortable that's, that's enough for, for the time being. But if we feel like that things are getting more, uh, you know, uh, advantageous to add additional rigs than we would. Uh, as it relates to the overall acquisition strategy, um, you know, obviously the upstream continues to be our main focus uh, in buying existing production and, and really we're focused more so on the central region where we feel there's a premium price that will continue to be given to gas produced that has access to those LNG facilities. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that that's going to the capacity there is going to double over the next few years uh, and gas that's being produced on the Gulf Coast area, East Texas, Louisiana, is going to have a premium price attached to it. And so we're we're really heavy, heavily looking into that area and, and feel like we're going to be able to close on some additional acquisitions uh, in that in that basin. That's great. And in fact, just a just keeping on that theme of acquisitions, if I may, a, a very good question here. How has the pricing of acquisitions evolved? You know, has it become harder to find opportunities at the right price? And really broadly, how has the competition evolved in this space? Yeah, well, competitively, you know, what we have determined is, is that because we have liquidity and we, and we have a, a history of being able to execute on transactions, um, most companies, whether, no matter where they're selling or no matter what they're looking at selling, they're calling us. Uh, so we're always on the list of short list of people that are capable of acquiring anything out there that, that comes to market. Now, there's a there can be dislocations between what the seller's uh, expectations are and what our expectations are, and that happens a lot. We walk on deals that we, we just won't overpay for. Um, but I will say that the competition, it's very difficult to get capital. So unless you have capital and have liquidity, it's going to be hard to get it for bigger deals. And so we've got four or five hundred million of liquidity. We, people know we can execute. So we don't have any real competition from that perspective. I, I think the biggest competition we have 
is the seller's hold case, uh, or in some cases now the ABS structure that we use so uh, predominantly is being, you know, evaluated by a lot of these companies to see if that's a, a mechanism for them to, uh, to get some of their money back out of their assets. So, um, not a lot of competition, capital constraints do a lot of, you know, have resulted in a low competitive, uh, uh environment, but at the end of the day, our ability to execute, our ability to have, you know, to have liquidity to, to close on deals uh, is giving us a pretty good advantage. Yeah. And, and I think that an emergent piece of that competitive advantage has been the progress we've made on the ESG front, because, yeah, as you see more sophisticated and, and certainly larger companies that have uh, public reputations that they maintain, when they divest of assets, they need to be sure they're divesting to someone that they trust will steward those assets appropriately, not only operationally, but from an environmental perspective. So our improving profile and our more sophisticated ESG programs are serving us well as we're sitting across the table from some of those larger sellers uh, that they can really trust. We will be good next owners of that asset. And I think that's uh, that also gives, as Rusty was saying, you have pricing power uh, from the negotiation when you have access to cash. Well, similarly, you have that power when you can demonstrate that you have a the right type of reputation for them to sell to. That's great. Well, Rusty, Eric, thank you very much indeed. I am mindful you've got a full day of back-to-back uh, -back meetings over here in the UK. And, and thank you to everybody for your questions this afternoon. And any questions we haven't got through, we'll make available to the company who can publish responses if it's appropriate to do so. And we'll make those available on the Investor Meet company platform. Um, Rusty, Eric, I know investor feedback is particularly important to you both, and I'll shortly redirect investors to give you their thoughts and expectations. But I wondered if before doing so, if I may, Rusty, just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with and then I'll redirect investors to give you their feedback. Yeah, yeah. thank you all for uh, taking time today to uh, listen in and, and really learn about the company. Uh, we've got a bright future. Uh, the, the U.S. macro, the, the environment that we're operating in right now is, is very strong and we feel like we're positioned extremely well uh, to grow the company into the future uh, and, and to be one of those uh, producing uh, and, and uh, pr production companies that obviously doesn't drill, but operates mature wells for the long, for the long haul and, and, and then uh, operates them efficiently um, and with an ESG uh, eye up on the, on the assets and operating structure. Uh, and then, you know, gets as much production out of them as possible over the long haul. Uh, and we think that's a prudent way to approach the, the industry over the, for, for the long term. So thank you again for your time today. Uh, and like you said, any other questions, please feel free to put, put them through and we'll, we'll get back to you. That's great. Rusty, Eric, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Can I please ask investors not to close the session as we now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. This only takes a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Diversified Energy PLC, we'd like to thank you very much for attending this afternoon's presentation. That now concludes today's session and may I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon.